Hi there, my name is Selena. I'm a graduate student of clinical psychology and on this channel I like to introduce you to interesting, thought-provoking, new but old psychodynamic thinkers that you probably haven't heard of but should have. And today you're in for a very special treat because today I'm going to introduce you to Karen Horney. Uh, and I really hope you're not here because you misspelled Horney. And yes, you can call her Karen, but in German we pronounce her name as Karen Horney. Karen Horney was born in Hamburg and lived from 1885 to 1952. And her theories and views are very similar to our all-time favorite Alfred Adler about whom I have made many videos already in this channel and together with Adler and some other psychoanalysts she is considered a neo-Freudian and that is because she deviated from Freud's theories in different ways but was still within the psychodynamic approach. So how exactly did she differ from Freud? Freud put a great emphasis on drives such as the drive for aggression and the drive for sex and he emphasized the importance of going through the psychosexual development and that was something Hohenai really didn't agree with. On the one hand she thought that Freud really misunderstood females which he did and she emphasized that there's actually no biological proof that men are superior to women which Freud kind of argued for with the penis envy which somehow explains male superiority and I'm, I'm totally not getting this right but the reason is that it, it was a very weird theory and by now of course it has been disputed and it is no longer applicable. So Honai moved away from this biological understanding of neurosis and this focus on the pleasure principle and instead she focused on relationships and she focused on the importance of culture and society. Because as she moved from Germany to the United States she found that there are certain cultural differences and those differences in culture actually are important if we look at psychopathologies, if we look at how people develop. So Hane said that actually the person is not ruled by the pleasure principle, but by the need to find safety. Before we continue on what exactly she meant with safety and how the other concepts such as basic anxiety, basic inner conflict and so on are connected to that, I would like to explain to you how actually Horne thought about a neurosis because she developed one of the most elaborate theories on neurosis that we have. I would be guessing that most of you probably are a bit lost to what exactly a neurosis is and that is completely understandable because today the word is not really used anymore. It was used a lot in the past, more or less until 1980 when the Diagnostic Manual 3 came out and they kind of replaced the word neurosis that was used pretty common before that with different more specific terms. In the past Past a neurosis referred to a mental illness or a mental disorder that could basically encompass a lot of symptoms. It could be anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive behavior, basically anything but psychotic symptoms, which would be delusions or hallucinations. And you can see because this is like such a broad term that it was not really desirable to have this as a diagnosis, but we wanted to be more specific. So from 1980s onwards, this term has more or less been replaced with more specific terms. But if you look at older psychodynamic literature, you will find the word neurosis everywhere. So it makes sense to define what exactly Hohenheim means with that. So Freud emphasized a very biological view of the neurosis, which came about through destructive drives of sex and aggression or through not properly going to the psychosexual development. Hanai, on the other hand, really emphasized the need for relationships and self-realization in the process of developing a neurosis or not. According to Honai, a neurosis means that a person deviates in behavior from the social and cultural norms, that a person shows behavior that is rigid and monotonous, and that a person shows a strong discrepancy between ability and performance. Furthermore, a neurotic person suffers from strong anxiety and they seem to be pursuing opposite goals. What exactly that means is going to become clear once we talk about the basic conflict. So if we circle back to Hanai's emphasis on seeking safety rather than seeking pleasure, we need to come to one of her most important key concepts, and that is basic anxiety. Hanai said that the worst thing that can possibly happen to a child is of course if either it experienced violence in his home or if the parents are indifferent. And Hanai called indifference of the parents the basic evil. If a child has indifferent parents who don't really care about the child, who don't really respond to the child's needs, the child develops a feeling of hopelessness, of helplessness, of living in a world that is basically hostile and you're all alone. Now you can imagine as a child this feeling of basic anxiety is too much to bear. 
even as adults it's too much to bear. So we have to find ways in order to deal with this basic anxiety. So how exactly can a child defend itself against this anxiety? On the one hand, this basic anxiety can stir the child into complete compliance, which means that it's kind of moving towards people, it's seeking other people, it seeks to belong, it seeks love, it seeks attention. Or the child can develop what Hanai called basic hostility. It becomes aggressive towards the caretakers and aggressive towards other people, which means moving against people. Or a third way of dealing with this basic anxiety is to completely withdraw. So you do not move towards people, you do not move against people, but you move away from people. Now we all have these three strategies at hand that we can use in, in our everyday life. And it's pretty normal to have all of them. I mean, we all need to be aware, okay, when is there a time when I need to seek belonging to other people, when I need to depend on other people, when do I need to seek freedom and I need to be independent, and when do I have to assert my limits or my physical safety. So it's very good to be able to access all three of them while you go about your life and you walk through the world. So in relationships to other people, we need to be able to employ all of these three strategies as the situation demands. And we kind of need to be flexible because we need to adapt constantly to relationships and to the world. But those strategies or those moves or trends, as they're also called, are not just interpersonal, but they're also intrapsychic, which means they also do something with the way you internally see yourself, not just how you interact with other people. These trends or these moves become neurotic when one of them becomes the primary strategy. Because as I said before, in a healthy individual, we have access to all three strategies that we can employ as we please and as is needed in a situation. But in a neurotic person, one of those strategies becomes the primary strategy and all others are suppressed. So for example, the only way you can deal with others is that you seek other people. You cannot be alone, you cannot assert your limits or you're in constant conflict with other people. You cannot really find a way to belong or you cannot really find a way to be independent of people or you completely withdraw from all sorts of social interactions and you become a lone wolf in the world. In a neurotic person, those three strategies don't exist aside from one another. You can kind of use any of them as you please, but they're opposite one another. So if you would be a neurotic person and for some reason or another, you would have chosen for moving against other people, it is very, very hard for you to accept soft feelings, to feel love for other people, because you're in constant competition for power. However, we would like to think that we can actually repress those other strategies, but they're still there. They still linger inside of you, in your psyche, in your unconscious, and this is where they create the basic conflict. So as soon as emotions, behavior, or thoughts don't align with the primary strategy that you have chosen, it's not just that they can completely be repressed, but they linger and they create pressure. Actually, before Hanai came up with those three trends, she discovered that there are 10 neurotic needs. Neurotic needs are needs that everyone has. I'm going to explain them in detail in another video, but in a neurotic person, they become extreme. So everyone needs love, everyone needs approval, but a neurotic person needs an extreme amount of love and approval that basically can never be satisfied. Or every person needs some sort of freedom, some sort of self-efficiency, but a neurotic person needs to be so free that they can never belong to anyone or never depend on anyone else. And those 10 neurotic needs can be summarized into those three neurotic trends. I explained before that according to Hanai, a neurotic person will deny any sort of emotion, thought or behavior that doesn't align with the primary move. And this complete focus, this complete fixation on one strategy and the denial of anything else is a defense mechanism against basic anxiety that we would call, well, denial. However, Hanai said that there's also another way of defending yourself against basic anxiety, and that would be idealization. These so-called defense mechanisms are an extremely interesting theory, an extreme interesting part of psychodynamic thinking that I would like to spend more time on in the future. Um, but basically, defense mechanism is employed whenever we have to face something, for example, a truth about ourselves, that we just cannot accept. It is impossible for us to accept this truth about ourselves or the world. And therefore we unconsciously repress, idealize, deny, rationalize, we use humor, whatever we need to, in order to not face this truth. 
And now Hanai says that there's not just the denial of other strategies, but there's also a defense mechanism that she calls idealization. That means if you choose to move towards other people, you're not just a kind person, but you're the kindest person that ever lived. You're so, so freaking kind. Or if you choose to move against other people, you're not just good at negotiating, you're like the best entrepreneur, the best business person to ever live. Or if you choose to move away from people, it's not just that you like freedom, but you're the freest person ever. You don't need anyone. You don't need to be depending on anything or anyone. It's only you and you're the freest person to ever live. And on the quest for this glory, for this sort of idealized version of yourself, you will find that your actual self, the self that you currently are, doesn't really align with this idealized self. This striving for the idealized self is mostly unconscious, but according to Hanai, we can see it in claims or entitlement. And if these claims are directed against the self, they come out as inner tyrants, or what Hanai would call tyranny of the shoulds, which is incredibly interesting. I'm definitely gonna make another video about that. I think I read it once that you should all over yourself. Um, I should do this, I should do that. And these shoulds are really extreme. For example, I should never not feel loved. I should always understand others. I should never be hurt. And of course, you can see how this search for glory, this search of an idealized self that can definitely never exist, can lead to very neurotic behavior. Hanai's approach to therapy then was that the main task is to lessen the anxiety of the patient. Through lessening the anxiety, the patient then should be able to give up these neurotic strategies and find a more integrated way of employing each strategy as it is suited. And therefore, the patient would be able to self-realize and grow instead of constantly trying to fulfill an idealized self that will never be the case, that can never be achieved. And you can see how this then also improves the relationships that the patient experiences. And if we know anything, it's that the quality of our relationships and the quality of our lives are intricately bound to one another. Another very interesting thing that Hane suggested was that self-analysis is actually possible. And I mean, psychoanalysis is kind of the holy grail, of course. Um, usually every psychoanalyst will tell you that this is the most important thing ever and you need to be in psychoanalysis a lot and it basically never stops. And touching this holy grail, I do have respect for that. Uh, she wrote a whole book about it. I haven't read it yet, so I cannot say too much about it. But basically she says that self-analysis is possible and actually you can use her theories and you can use certain elements of psychoanalysis to treat yourself. Of course, I mean, I hope I don't have to say that, but if you're dealing with mental health issues, please seek the help of a professional and don't just do it yourself. Let me know if there's an aspect of Karen Hohenay's theories that you're especially interested in. I definitely want to make a video about basic anxiety, the basic conflict and the neurotic needs and trends. But if there's anything else, just let me know in the comments below. I wish you a wonderful day and see you next time. Bye bye.